cell loss in Alzheimer's disease is more severe than normal ageing. Now, in normal ageing, you will have brain cell loss of up to 30% of your brain cell volume in normals or normal ageing. But in Alzheimer's disease, you will have 50% plus of brain volume will be lost as the person ages with Alzheimer's disease. And it's mostly in the frontal and temporal regions. So it's the temporal lobes here on the side where the hippocampus is, and also the frontal area. But it also affects the parietal area and the occipital area as well, but to a lesser degree. The major losses are in those frontotemporal areas. Here we see two scans. You will see on the right hand side the normally aged brain, which is very full in the brain cavity in the skull. And this is a slide, a slice with a CT scan of through the brain here sideways. So vertically through the brain. So what we've got here is a, a slide that illustrates how the brain is very full and you've got lots of white matter here in the centre and that is surrounded by a layer of grey matter where most of the cell bodies reside. The grey matter in any of these scans is generally associated with intense populations of cell bodies. So those cell bodies are located in the, what's known as the cortex. The cortex is the four to six millimetre layer of tissue surrounding the brain. Okay, four to six millimetres thick. Within that, you have the, the connections or the association areas, which are the long axon, which is like the stem or the trunk of the, of the, the axon of the, of the brain cell. The best shot is if I can draw a foot. No, what? I'll just go back. Here we are. We have the cell body with dendrites coming in from other neurons. The impulse comes in from other neurons through the nucleus. There's a chemical and electrical impulse, which we'll see in a moment. And that triggers a, a release of the chemical and electrical impulse down the axon. The axon is this area. And this axon then stimulates the release of other chemicals here between that axon and the dendrites of another neuron. Is that okay so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's go forward a bit here. What we have here in these white areas is the fatty tissue called myelin. Now myelin is like a sheath. It's like the hose, that the rubber hose that protects the flow of water through your garden hose. Now imagine if you had lots of holes in your garden hose. What happens to the water? It All leaks out. What happens to the pressure of the water at the end? Is it coming out as fast? if you've got it all escaping? No. So myelin is like the cover that enables the impulse to flow down the axon with great speed and great efficiency. And it shows up in these scans as white because it's a fat. So myelin is a really important part of efficient brain function and it is what is eaten away in multiple sclerosis. The myelin sheath, the sheath is that cover over the axon, and it's made up of in little portions. So the axon will be along here, and the myelin sheath will be in that section, and there will be a gap, and there will be another section, of myelin sheath. And this is a little gap. And this protects the flow, this fatty tissue. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's why you have the white matter and the grey matter. 
So the grey matter you'll notice is about four to six millimetres thick and it's folded in all the way around the folds of the brain. And so you end up with a, an area of grey matter around about that big if you were to fold it all out. Fairly large. But what happens when we look over to this scan of a brain with Alzheimer's disease? What do you notice? There's, um, there are a lot more black gaps. The black is brain fluid. So there's no tissue there anymore. No, so the brain has shrunk. The brain has shrunk. Atrophied. Yeah, atrophied. So what we have here is a decrease in the white matter and a marked decrease in the volume of grey matter. The cortex, where all the brain cell bodies are, has shrunk in, in, in thickness. With the result that the person's function will have declined markedly. Now you'll notice here, let me just focus on this scan over here on the right, which is the normally aged brain. You'll notice here this area at the side, this is what we call the temple. This is your temple here. This is your temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe goes in underneath and it wraps around an area called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is like an almond shaped area that looks well, a little bit like an almond there in slice and there's a stem to this temporal lobe that folds around in on itself right in to the, the hippocampus which is nestled in there towards the center and the hippocampus is where we process a lot of our conscious verbal memory what we know we know if I can tell a story about myself, if somebody asks me, who are you? Where do you come from? I can tell stories about myself. I'm relying on knowledge that is usually stimulated in that area of the brain, the hippocampus. But is the hippocampus then always affected? Because if I think of a certain, you know, a certain message, you uh, she was full of stories. <clears throat> full of stories about her life. Sure. She may well have had quite significant change in the hippocampus, but still be able to access some stories. But it might be that her dementia was not Alzheimer's disease, or it wasn't the only form of disease that was causing her dementia. If she had vascular disease, then her verbal skills and her ability to express herself may well have been more intact. And that's what I meant earlier when I asked you about all the diseases that were there. Right. The diagnosis then should never be dementia. The diagnosis should be Lewy body's disease. The disease. Should be. Yeah. Because for us, if we go into the um, uh, personal profile, sure. it says dementia. Yeah. If you're lucky. Well, for actually, you need that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for actually, you need you yeah. need to diagnose that. You do. Yeah. Then the match is not diagnosed. Well, the difficulty is it's impossible to confirm which disease process is actually causing the dementia until you get an autopsy. So until you get the brain tissue under the microscope, you can't confirm. So what you get is often a disease that used to be known as SDAT, which is suspected dementia of the Alzheimer type. So you'll get uh, now they they put that shorthand aside these days and they'll just write dementia. That's become the the default. So it, and uh, generally there's not a lot of volunteers for autopsy. So people are not <laughs> people are not stepping forward to say, well, I'm going to even have a bit of my brain tissue. So we well, we can't confirm that until the person's dead. And most of the time they don't bother mm -hmm. to do that these mm -hmm. days unless the person is part of a, an ongoing study in which case their brain might be donated to science. Yeah. But usually there won't be any confirmation of it. So it's a suggested or possible uh, diagnosis. So you're absolutely right, but there's no way to confirm it short of death. Yeah. And is that diagnosis usually 
does that often come about more by observing behaviour? Yeah. Things like that? Yeah. And it's listening to the story of progressive decline over time. So there'll be a clinical examination and a gathering of a history and a CT scan. Because what you're trying to rule out, and generally it's a diagnosis by ruling out other possibilities. So you would rule out any other organic cause, such as nutritional deficiency, um, a brain tumour, uh, strokes, whatever it might be. So you're ruling out other possibilities, or a UTI. Is there some other disease that's causing this that we can treat? Is it depression? Because depression can often look a bit like dementia at times. So it is by exclusion, really. So you're absolutely right, Linda. If we had that choice, it would be the better way to go. But it is impossible to attribute at any person's dementia to a particular disease. We can have a good stab at it, and it will fit the pattern of Alzheimer's disease better than anything else, but we can't confirm it. And so that's why some doctors will, will quite rightly, step away from actually saying it's Alzheimer's. Yeah. So they'll go for dementia, if you're lucky. Some of them will still say short-term memory loss, yeah. which is completely unhelpful. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, Sometimes we find a case whereby someone can still remember mostly things to do with their past. Yes. You know, like what um, she was saying to say, there's this other client who remembers mostly about the past. Yeah. But if you ask them, like, what happened like two hours ago, yeah. they cannot remember. That's, so, uh, that's right. Like and that's where the most recent layers come off first. Like, most recent memories will come And remarkably, off. there are about six or seven layers within the hippocampus. That that exact sort of process is believed to take place. Oh. The laying down of so memory. Someone can tell you what happens, like you know, family history. Yeah. Years ago, yeah. they won't be able to tell you what happened. Yeah. So yeah. if you stimulate certain cells in the hippocampus, you'll stimulate memories at different times in a person's life. Let's keep moving. What you've got here is what looks like a slice through a piece of a vegetable. You know, the uh, cauliflower? Mm -hmm. yeah, it looks a little bit like that. If you were to slice a cauliflower, you'll get a similar sort of yeah. the stem and little florets yeah. folded in on itself. Now, look across here. What do you notice? Shrunk in volume, hasn't yeah. it? Okay. So here, there is much less, there's more dark areas. Mm -hmm. There is less tissue showing up here in the hippocampal area because the cell bodies are less intense, less dense. And here the layer of the grey matter is much thinner. And the, the white matter is also thinner. So the cell bodies have died and, the, and as they, they die they are scavenged up and they're taken away. And uh, so the brain volume gradually decreases. And you can see the decrease is global over the entire volume of the brain. Even internally, this area is much larger. And this area is what we call the ventricle. The ventricle is filled with brain fluid, and the brain fluid flows in an internal piping down into the brain's column, into the spinal column. And so the spinal fluid surrounds the spinal nerve and all the nerve endings in your spine inside the bones. And that then goes right down to your coccyx. And so that flow is constantly moving backwards and forwards. That brain fluid is continuous into the spinal column through these ventricles. Is that clear for everybody? Aura. Now the plaques, let's go into this in a little more detail. The plaques are found in very old brains and brains with Alzheimer's disease. So there tends to be a, a tendency as we age to develop more of these plaques, which suggests that there's a normal ageing process goes on as well as a disease process. The core of this amyloid plaque is a, is a protein. And this is the, the, um, the detail of it in terms of the genes associated with this protein. It's what's called a beta amyloid precursor protein, 
and we find a lot of it on chromosome 21. Anybody tell me what chromosome 21 is associated with? Down syndrome. And we know that people who have Down syndrome are going to develop Alzheimer's disease should they live long enough. 100% chance. And we have a lady with Down syndrome. Yeah. Okay, and I know you do that. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. She was young. She was 50. I mean, 50? She looks much older. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah, they do tend to age a lot more quickly. Yeah. Um, Precentile forms are linked to chromosome 21, which is associated with Down syndrome, and chromosome 14. There's a the protein as part of these amyloid plaques, which is called apolipoprotein E, commonly known as APOE. Because apolipoprotein is a mouthful, which you can only say if you haven't been drinking. <laughs> this gene is on chromosome 19, and it's also a risk factor for vascular disease and hypercholesterolemia. So there's a number of diseases associated with these gene changes. But the role of this allele, this gene, is not clear. So the research is really ongoing with this. And there's quite a lot of uh, effort goes into it. And if you attend these Alzheimer's disease conferences, you get a lot of the newest research happening each year. There's an enormous amount of effort going into this, particularly develop, um, fostered by the drug companies, for obvious reasons, that there may in fact be a pot of gold at the end of their rainbow. Um, if there are drugs that can be developed that can prevent Alzheimer's disease development, uh, then these drug companies want to be in on it. So they foster a lot of this research. The neurotransmitters are important here. These are the drugs, the, sorry, the drug, these are the chemicals that are in short supply in brains that are affected by Alzheimer's disease, particularly. These are the ones that are affected by it. Generally, there's an overall decrease in these vital neurotransmitters. The most important one, because it's the one that is most affected by Alzheimer's disease, is acetylcholine, sometimes called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine if it's in smaller quantities than it should be, and it was low quantities, then you'll have problems with motivation, memory, movement, and attention. So you can see there that it's going to affect things like your mood, your depression, and also um, your, if it's movement, then your Parkinson's symptoms will be worse. Fluidity of movement. So acetylcholine is a very important chemical, neurotransmitter. Can anyone tell me the names of the drugs that you sometimes see some of your residents still on that are given to them to slow down the progress of Alzheimer's disease? Tenepazil? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the other one? There's four of them. There's about four of them on the PBS at the moment. Yes, I've been the That's the Another one's called Remedil. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone know the fourth one? Yes. All right, that can be your homework. Because I can't remember either. No. <laughs> All right, those four are designed to top this up. They top up acetylcholine. Through, indirectly through affecting other things. The next neurotransmitter that we are interested in is noradrenaline. And there are some antidepressants that are noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. And they're called SNRIs, not SSRIs. SNRIs. Selective noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. And some of them will in fact try to affect both serotonin and noradrenaline. Glutamate, 
causes problems with long-term memory, in other words, not enough glutamate, causes problems with long-term memory and pain perception. In other words, you feel more pain. Melatonin, can anyone tell me what melatonin is usually associated with? Sleep. Sleep, yeah. yeah. So when Bernadette got back from her trip overseas, she would have had jet lag, I presume. Yeah, not greatly though. Not greatly? No, I was pretty Aren't lucky. Aren't you lucky? Yeah. My daughter takes it every night because she can't sleep without. Right. Mm. Okay. And I think it's more readily available in Australia now than it used to be, but uh, for I a while you couldn't get it. I always say stuff because the uh, pediatric doctor that we went said the dosage here is not high enough. So he yes. gave me a website where I can order it from the States. Yeah. And she. Yeah, I agree. It's much easier. So melatonin is a really important neurotransmitter because it helps to regulate our circadian rhythm our sleep-wake cycle mm -hmm. and that is why when it's disrupted by the loss of brain cells in Alzheimer's disease that's why we get the disruptions to sleep-wake cycle for people with Alzheimer's disease. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So why, why isn't it prescribed to a lot of elders there? Very good question. Because it's a, it's a natural Treatment. Yes, it is a natural treatment. And unfortunately, we have care staff that find that they should sleep at night and not be up all night. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a very good question. That would help them. You would think, yeah. We don't know what else, if you were to give that, would it disrupt other things? Mm -hmm. We don't know. So that's a possibility. But worth asking. And finally, serotonin, which is associated with, in, in uh, when it's disrupted with depression, insomnia, loss of appetite, pain and aggression, all of which you might find in somebody with depression. I'm actually really surprised because we have a lot of people still taking tomatoes at night, which mm -hmm. is helpless, mm -hmm. but the doctor prescribes that. And then I'm looking at melatonin and I'm just gobsmacked. Why didn't they? Yeah. It could well be very useful. Okay. Yeah. But we need to, I would like to read the literature before I commented on that, to yeah. be honest. And I might go and do that, I'll see if I can do that tonight. Yeah, I think, so, um, I really feel that would be so helpful. Okay. Then. We'll see what the literature right. says, because I'm sure people have explored it. Yes. It makes too much sense. Yeah. Okay, shall we move on? Yeah. Let's look in detail then at each of these. Certainly. Not, maybe not all of them, but we'll look firstly at acetylcholine. Low levels in Alzheimer's patients, about 60 to 90% lower than normal. And in the basal forebrain cholinergic system. Now the forebrain is this area of your brain. And the basal area of that is low down underneath. It's like the underneath of the veranda. Okay? Behind your eyes you go in underneath. And that area is where the cholinergic system, the acetylcholine system, is where you would normally find all the processing around memory, word finding, spatial memory, in other words, remembering where things are. And isn't this one of the problems with Alzheimer's disease? People get lost. Mm -hmm. And behavioural control. Interesting association. So what we've got is very much a chemical response that all of these behavioural Issues or experience, life issues, are going to show up. We change the levels of chemicals, it affects us in all of our function. Okay. Now, I've just focused on acetylcholine because it's one of, it's the most important one that we know of. And you could do some more research if you wanted to on each of the other areas. And melatonin, I think, is one that's very popular to research into, but you might like to look at some of the others, like glutamate. What's glutamate associated with? Just for, out of your interest. There's no assessment associated with that, but just as a, an interest question. All right. Now, this is a, a little graphic just to illustrate what's called dendritic degeneration. Dendrites are these connections from other neurons. The processing travels down from other neurons towards others. So the process of information is down. 
in this illustration. In a young adult with normal brain development, this is what we see. A very thick forest of connectedness. However, in an older brain, we see this thinning out of connections between the brain cells. Much thinner. Fewer connections. 